Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Therese, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't you like that picture of St. Therese there? She looks happy, doesn't she? Yeah. As, that's the beginning of her religious life. That's before she knew what she was getting herself into. <laughs> now, uh, and at the end, as she actually called her consecration to divine mercy, her offering to merciful love, uh, the day she did that, the happy day. Um, and uh, I hope this is a happy day for you guys because you're finishing your retreat. Some of you guys are going to be doing the consecration still because of the timing. Some of you have already done it either way. At least this is the end of having to hear Father Mike, so I hope you're happy. Uh, but if you're happy for that, um, you're not happier than I am. <laughs> uh, nobody's happier than I am because this, as I mentioned in the introduction, is probably the last major program for the Hearts of Fire programs that we've done. Um, you know, we'll probably do supplementary programs or that type of thing, or you, you never know what God has in store. But I think this is the last major one, uh, at least for the formation materials for the Marian missionary. So I'm like, yes, okay. Um, and I'm super happy with that because it's been something of a wild ride. If you include You Did It To Me, the uh, videos that we did for that book, then that's five major uh, small group programs for parishes uh, in, in four years. Uh, and that includes writing the books, writing the study guides, doing the filming, writing all the talks, doing all the editing afterwards and all that, so pray for us. Um, so uh, the wild ride, I hope, is, is coming to an end. So I'm super happy. But for this last session of the most important of all those programs, I want to leave you with a parting gift. Um, and actually, that parting gift, I think, maybe comes from St. Therese uh, rather than Father Mike. I have a bunch of roses here. No, just kidding. <laughs> and that parting gift, I think, that came from St. Therese because there was, I was thinking about, I had, it took me a while to, uh, to do this concluding uh, uh, talk. And that's because I had all these different, um, the first one, I had all these stories that I thought, I, maybe I'll share these. 
And I was like, nah, I, I think that's a bit too much. And uh, I said, no. So I prepared three other talks and I actually had a group of friends. I was like, hey, can you, I'm having a problem with this. Would you guys listen to this? They listened to it. They're like, no, N no. <laughs> and then I said, well, what I was thinking about doing was sharing some of these stories. What are the stories? I told them, they said, yeah, do that. So um, if you like this talk, then, um, then uh, you can, well, if you don't like the talk, you can thank my friends. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, if you like the talk, thank Therese. If you don't like it, then it's my friend's fault. <laughs> How's that? All right. Okay, uh, before I start telling the stories, though, I need to share one thing. I should say something about St. Therese uh, that I haven't, I haven't shared yet. Uh, St. Therese is a very shocking saint. And what I mean by that is, you know, other saints, you, you pray a novena or something like that, and they help you, and it's often like subtle ways. They're like, oh, you know, you can't really see them. Therese, um, even though she's French, she's not so subtle. Um, she's more Italian. Um, <laughs> now, uh, she's kind of a shocker. When she's helping you, it's like uh, you, you often can't miss it. It's like there'll be a rose right after, you know, it's just really crazy things. Now, blessed are those who believe without seeing, right, all that. But nevertheless, she sometimes shocked people. So don't, if you don't get special grace, don't worry. God just loves you more because you have a greater faith. Um, but the idea, she, she foretold that she would be this kind of shocking saint. Uh, before her death, she said, uh, When I die, uh, I will send down a shower of roses from the heavens. I will spend my heaven doing good on earth. And she has, uh, and she does, and she sends roses. I mean, there's a gazillion stories about how Therese is, like, you know, gives roses to people in different circumstances. In fact, I have one story that I'll share real quick. Uh, I can't remember if I shared it in the, the 33 Days to Mercy, Morning Glory, but you could hear it again and offer it up. But the idea is, when I was in high school, I shared in the last session that I had something of a conversion, right? Before I thought, I want to be a big shot. And I'm like, ah, forget that. I want to be a saint. And then I forgot all about the big shot stuff and was like, ah, oh, that's, you know, that's gone. I don't worry about being big shot in the world. I need big shot in the spiritual life, right? Okay. So, um, <laughs> but actually I didn't. I did do some looking back, uh, as I shared, right? The magazine that was on the, on, the, the lunch, on the table when I was having lunch. But one of the things, ways that I was sort of looking back after my conversion in high school was when it came to picking colleges. Uh, because when it came time to picking colleges, I had two choices, really. One, the one I wanted to go to, which was a great, sec a great university, a great secular university, that would help me to become a big shot. Um, nothing wrong with that, you know, but that's, I mean, to be a big, sh uh, to go to a secular university. Uh, but I felt like the Lord wanted me to go to this smaller college that I think could better help me to become a saint. So I wanted to do my thing, he wanted, and he was wanting me to go to this smaller college, and um, I was having a hard time letting go of the not going to the big university. In fact, a really hard time, I wasn't going to do it. Thanks be to God, a friend of mine, uh, my confirmation sponsor, he started saying a novena to St. Therese for me uh, without me asking him. And in fact, his novena was that I go to the, uh, to the, Catholic, um, the Catholic school, the small Catholic school. Um, so he was praying that novena, and I said, well, just pray a novena that I do God's will. He said, it's God's will that you go to the Catholic school. <laughs> so he's doing the novena. In the meantime, I'd heard that St. Therese will sometimes send you different color roses to make different decisions. So I stacked the deck. I said, okay, red rose, then the, 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 uni the big uni secular university. Yellow rose, the small Catholic college, because yellow roses are less common. Uh, no roses, I'm going to the secular school. <laughs> <laughs> so I stacked the deck, but I got a whole bunch of yellow roses. And that's why I decided to go to the Catholic school. That was the main reason. I wasn't happy about it. But I thought, you know, this saint who's sending down uh, who sends down roses, if I don't keep my end of the bargain, she's going to send down lightning bolts and punish me. <laughs> so I went. And I, at first I wasn't happy about it, but it was one of the best decisions I ever made. And if it weren't for that decision, if it weren't for those roses, I wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't be hearing this talk. Because if it weren't, if it weren't for that college, that's where I met Blanche. Uh-huh, right? And, uh, and Blanche sent me those, that relic of St. Therese. And that got me really reading about St. Uh, Therese more. Um, I might have found a different way, but it might have been different circumstances. But I think if I wouldn't have gotten those roses, I wouldn't be here now, and I certainly wouldn't be here talking about uh, St. Therese. I'd be talking about big shot stuff, right? No, I probably would fell on my face. But anyway, um, so St. Therese is this shocker. Uh, but what she asked for is kind of a shocker too. You know, that, Lord, I want to spend my heaven doing good on earth. And the reason I say that is because kind of a traditional idea was that the saints are in heaven 
and they call heaven eternal rest, right? So it's like I always pick the saints up there like, oh, like they're half asleep, right? Like, oh, you know, just this peaceful state. But the, um, and I kind of felt bad about bothering them. Like, oh, could you help me? Oh, uh, yeah, okay, here you go. You know, like waking them up. <laughs> Therese, though, she's like, I'm going to spend my heaven doing, like, doing this. She's like, had five cuts of coffee. She's like, come on, ask me something. Right? And, and uh, she just wants to go crazy helping us. Now, she's been given that grace not because she had a bunch of spiritual coffee, but what well, kind of spiritual coffee, but that she asked God for that. And she had this great confidence that God would give to her what she asked for when it had to do for things that were good for the kingdom. And so she was convinced that God would give her that grace of allowing her to continue to work from heaven. She, only, she died when she was only 24 years old. And he's really given her that, that grace. And so there's a ton of stories. There's a ton of stories I could share about how St. Therese continues to work in dra- dramatic ways. Um, but some of the stories that I want to share now, I'm going to limit just to sort of this program and what's surrounding this program. And, uh, and I say that because here at the end, I really feel that St. Therese is trying to say, um, okay, so I'm using this knucklehead priest right now, but I'm trying to do something here. I sort of feel like she's really at work here. She has a message that she wants to say. She has a work that she wants to do. There's a big work that she wants to do that God is allowing her to do, uh, even using the weakest instruments like Father Mike and ourselves being here, right? Um, So again, if you you like this program, then blame St. Therese. If you don't like it, then you can blame me. All right, so let's start from the beginning with some of these stories to see what sort of St. Therese has been up to. and I'll start from the beginning, and like the very beginning. Um, this is a story, uh, it happened more than 10 years ago. It was a very dark, difficult time in my life. And I went uh, to visit this community that had both priests and nuns. It was kind of a newer community. And the nuns in the community, they had these names of saints that a lot of them you'd never heard of before. And one of the nuns that I met, her name was Sister Alexandrina. And I'm like, well, who's that? Who's your patroness? You know? and she told me this story of, uh, this, she was like a South American um, saint or blessed, and uh, she was a victim soul. And she only lived on the Eucharist for like 13 years or something. She was bedridden for like, you know, 40 years or something. Um, she apparently went through the Passion uh, every Friday. Great. You know, I was like, and I'm hearing all these things. And, and then she said to me, so she's got all this like, you know, really mystical like suffering stuff. And then uh, she said, and then the Lord told her, I want to save a million souls through you. But when I heard her say that, my heart dropped. Because I'm like, that's what it takes to, for the Lord to use us to save a million souls? Oh, man. But I want to save a million souls. I want to help Jesus save a million souls. But I don't want to do that. Right? I ne- I'm going to need a Big Mac or something, not just the Eucharist for 14 years. But the idea is, um, I remember I went, afterwards there was this or- ordination. I attended the ordination the whole time I was praying. And I was just really mad about that. I'm like, Lord, why? I want to, like, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not fair, you know. I guess it is fair because they go through all this suffering, but still, uh, you know, and I was upset. And I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart, not like some mystic type thing, but I just felt like he said, you know, uh, Michael, uh, I can save a million souls through you if you teach people to offer themselves as victims to my merciful love. And I remember that was like 10 years ago, and I remember it was clear enough that it stuck in my mind at least for a little bit, then I forgot about it. But while I was writing the book, those words actually came back to my mind. I thought, wow, the Lord's being faithful to this because I think it's true. If we offer ourselves to merciful love, it can bring a tremendous amount of good. How much good? What good can it bring about? Well, let's keep hearing some of the stories. First, some of the circumstances surrounding the book and the program that we're involved in. In the introduction, I already shared about Father Chris. Remember, he had that experience at Mass you know, all these mystical things don't always happen, but that was like a big experience where he did the consecration and he felt the rays and he said, the Lord wants a consecration of divine mercy and you need to write it. And I said, no. And then I said, yes, which I'll get to. Uh, but then, you know, the response was unprecedented. 60,000 books in, you know, a short period of time and all these people doing the consecration. That was like the Holy Spirit. Something was involved. The people in the offices were like, we've never seen something like this. And then when we did the consecration itself on the show, remember, the clouds opened up. Um, so something happened. What happened? Well, I'm not going to tell you. I still got to tell you the stories, right? So another thing that happened when I was doing, working on 33 Days to Merciful Love is I'm reading all these stories about how St. Therese is helping these people in, in these dramatic ways, you know, because, again, she's doing all this, you know, she's spending her heaven doing this work on earth. 
And I'm writing this book and I'm like, well, look, Trez, I'm doing all this work and it's killing me. Like it was a lot of work. And I'm like, so where are you? How, like, where's the smelling scent of roses and all these other things people experience? Where are you? And I was kind of mad, right? I was like, you know, I think I was tired and just, well, I get into the office and Father Chris comes up to me. The, Lord, the Holy Spirit likes to use Father Chris. So he comes up to me. He's like, hey, Mike, uh, I just got back from a mission in May and somebody gave me this letter to give to you. And he gave me the letter and I went to my office and I opened it and this is what it said. The same day I made that prayer in the morning, remember? Mm -hmm. Dear Father Michael, I wanted, to share, I wanted to write to share an experience from my visit to Stockbridge last Divine Mercy Sunday weekend. I know it has been many months since that spring visit. However, it was only recently I felt compelled to write you. Hmm, I wonder what got compelled her. Uh, my brother and I drove from Maine to Stockbridge for our first visit. Friday, we went to evening vespers in the chapel. We sat in the back, left, last pew. A young bearded man in a hoodie came in and sat at the end of our pew, slight in build, quiet. He sat at one end of the pew while we occupied the other. There were only three of us in the pew. After prayers, the young man got up and walked behind the pew, then up to the front pew and right side. As you passed behind us, I was a young man, I looked and smiled thinking you must have been traveling incognito that weekend with the beard and mustache. <laughs> what I wanted to share with you was that when you walked by, I saw two of you walk by. Saint Therese, her scent, her warmth, her calm, her being walked beside you. I felt, su I felt such compassion for you emanate from her. I remember that time I was going through a lot. It was not an easy weekend. Uh, never do I share something like this with someone whom I've never met. However, I felt I was supposed to let you know this. And as Father Alar was, that's Father Chris, Father Alar was coming to Maine to speak this weekend, I thought I would commit this to paper and send it with him to you. So what, so make of that what you will, all right? But the way I look at it, the, th the detail I love is that she looked at me with so much compassion. And, and I think that's not just me. I think what's going on right now with all of this is that Therese is looking at all of us with great compassion. Um, I think she feels sorry for us. I think she feels sorry for us for what's going on in the world and all these different things. And she has compassion and I think she's asked the Lord to use her to do something big for us, to help us. What is that thing? Well, I'll tell you another story. Well, I shared, you know, in the introduction about... Um, uh, about Father Chris, uh, you know, and how he said, you got to write this book, right? There was another part to that story. Um, you know, Father Chris had come into my office, you got to write this book. And at first I said, I don't have time to write any books. And he's like, well, if you don't, I will, but I think you're supposed to do it. And I was like, no. Well, the part I didn't share, it's in the introduction, but I'll share a little bit more about it, was um, I waited some time after he asked me to write it. He didn't write the book. We were both busy. And um, then a friend of mine from college called. Now that friend of mine from college is the same one. When I was in college, he gave me a copy of True Devotion to Mary by St. Louis de Montfort. And it was that book that inspired me to do my Marian consecration, which was a huge thing for me, and then inspired 33 Days to Merciful Love, really. Well, um, I hadn't talked to him for like 10 years or more. I mean, I, we weren't that close at school. He just gave me that book, whatever. He calls me up out of the blue. And he says, uh, Father Michael, I, I said, oh, hello, Mark. I said, Mark, I'd love to talk. I, this is great to hear from you, but I, I've got a book deadline that is due tomorrow, and I, this is the cr craziest time, so I've really got to run, but maybe I'll call you after it's done. He's like, well, no, that's no problem, but that's actually the reason I called. I said, what do you mean? He's like, because I know what your next book is going to be. And I was finishing a book, The Second Greatest Story Ever Told, and I was thinking in my mind that I wanted to um, write on St. Therese. I said, well what, is, what, well, what would that be? And he basically said, you need to write a book on St. Therese about doing a consecration, you know, with her little way and all that. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's it. I'll make a book on, because I was just going to do a book on St. Therese. I thought, I'll make a book on Therese that's like 33 days to morning glory, 33 days in preparation for the consecration to divine mercy. Just like Father Chris asked. So I went back to Chris. Chris, is it okay? He's like, heck yes. So I, I did the book. Um, well, it was interesting, and what's not in the introduction is that after I lost his number, I took his number down and then that call, and then I lost it, and as I never called him. And like a year later, I'd finished the book and I had the book in my hands. It had come out like the day before. And Mar Mark called me again out of the blue. He's like, Father Mike. I said, Mark, oh, it's so great to hear from you. I lost your number. I'm so, and I'm thinking, I got so much to tell you. He's like, hey, remember that time I called about a year ago? I said, yeah. 
He's like, well, that was real. I really feel like the Lord wants you to write a book. And I said, Mark, yeah, I wrote the book. He's like, and I told him about the book and everything. And he was, he was like, well, I said, and I put you in there too and everything. He's like, well, that's great. But, but you know, I've been praying more. I think maybe you're supposed to do another book. I'm like, whoa, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> He's like, well, I've been praying. And I think really what the heart of that book should be is that it's just what's on my heart is the Lord really wants someone to tell people to make a decision to become saints. We hear about, sometimes we hear about becoming a saint, although not very much. But to tell people, we got, it needs to be a decision, a concrete decision. I said, well, Mark, that's what the whole book's about. Becoming a saint through the little way, through the offering of merciful love. And so um, I said, I'll send it to you. Well, he, I sent it to him. He read it. He's like, no, it's not explicit enough. <laughs> it needs to be more explicit. And I asked him, and, and I said, look, I don't think this is another book, but I think there's a way that I can do this and, and tell people to make their consecration a decision to become a saint. He's like, okay, well, that's just what I feel we're supposed to do. I said, okay. So that's what I'm telling you now. Make your offering to merciful love. Make sure it's a decision to become a saint. Not by our own power. That's not the little way. But through the power of merciful love. But to make a decision to say, Jesus, help me to become a saint. And say the prayer I always say, Lord, I want to be a saint. Just be gentle, right? Like look at, and we look at all the people suffering. Lord, not even from, not, and he, actually this is, this is really the main point with it. You know, we want to become saints not so they'll make um, prayer cards out of us, right? And the plaster statues and, you know, okay, take it, you know, right? <laughs> it's like, no, it, what is the idea of us becoming saints? It's to help people. It's to help this world that is in so much need of some dramatic grace right now. That's what this is about. I remember that one time when I was praying for this image of Mary, her face looked very sad because it was a sad icon. And I was like, Mary, help me to become a saint, not for my sake, but I see that you're sad because you're concerned for all your children. I give you permission. You can use me any way you want. And if you don't use me, it's your fault. No. <laughs> but it's like, you're a mother, you're hurt, concerned for this. I'm a knucklehead and everything, but I give you permission to use me any way you want. And I haven't stopped working in five years since that prayer, right? And it's been great. But that's that, the idea. We look at the world, see how things are going. Lord, not for my sake, but for all your suffering children who are being lost or confused in darkness, you, I give you permission to use me. Just be gentle, right? That's what our offering to merciful love is. And so this retreat is about that dramatic grace, getting that dramatic grace for the world by helping, by becoming saints. So here at the end, what I'm saying is, may, take your consecration seriously. Take it seriously. Make a decision. I want to become a saint, Lord, through the power of your mercy for the sake of the world. Because in consecrating yourself to divine mercy, the Lord is entrusting you with a, a, a very important mission. It's a mission of mercy for the world that says you really can help save the world. It, we don't save the world. It's God's mercy. But he's looking for people to cry out for mercy, to receive mercy. That's what I think Therese is at, at work doing right now. That's what she's doing. She's working in heaven. She really is. And I think she has compassion on us in this crazy world. And she wants to help us. And the best way to help the world is to become a saint. Okay, but... Like how specifically? Well, actually, one thing I want to just say real quick, I forgot. Um, remember I told you Father Chris wrote that cover story? Marion Helper Magazine, right? Help save the world. You know, join us March 1st. That's when it started, 33 days then to, for Divine Mercy Sunday. Um, well, then after everything that happened, we're like, we've got to do a follow-up magazine. And so he did another cover story. So it went from this to then this. That there is hope. There's hope. Because Father Chris was like, man, something happened. When this, something happened. I feel it. Yeah, something's happened. But it's not a one-time shot. We need to keep going. Yes, I think that opened up a breach in this battle. It's like D-Day, right? You know, like the soldiers come on. But there's still a lot of fighting to do. But we landed. We got the consecration of divine mercy. This offering of merciful love that was so not very well known through this. St. Therese is, use, is going to use this to make it more known. I, I'd go to the talks. How many of you guys have heard of the Offering of Mercy Love? Very few, hand, very few hands would go up. Now I hope I'll give a talk. People are like, yeah, we know the Consecration of Divine Mercy. We know the Offering of Merciful Love because that's a game changer. It's as big a game changer as Marian Consecration, even bigger because Marian Consecration leads to a Consecration of Divine Mercy because Mary always brings us to Jesus and His mercy. Amen? Amen. All right, but how, how do we do it specifically? I've been talking a little bit about it. But here's the thing. I don't have time to get into all. Here's your homework. Reread day 26. Reread day 26 in the 33-day preparation to merciful love. 
day 26. In that, it talks about how we help save the world. Basically, it's about calling down mercy, crying out for mercy, crying out for mercy in light of the supercharged moment of the Mass that I always say is that moment, through Him, with Him, in Him, O oh God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Why is that so supercharged? Because we're taking the body and blood, soul and divinity, the perfect sacrifice of love that's held up to the Father, and we're just saying mercy. God has to have mercy. He'll get, when, when we ask in, in view of that perfect sacrifice of love of His Son, and that's what the chaplet of divine mercy is. It's an extension of that, right? Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, and, and so on. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. Crying out for mercy. Um, and it's begging for mercy, right? Ourselves, receiving mercy ourselves, asking for mercy for the world. Okay, read day 26. So, but, and, the, and the cool thing is it doesn't take that many. Remember, and you could read about that more also in day 26. It doesn't take that many, but we still need an army. St. Therese, remember she said, she had begged the Lord to choose a legion of little souls. A legion's like, I think a big army or a lot of, a lot of soldiers. Okay, so where are they though? Where is this army? Well, I have a good friend of mine, uh, Tim Gray. He's a biblical scholar. Maybe some of you guys heard of him. He's a great, great guy. Um, he one time told me a story, a biblical story, because he's you know, this smart guy with all the Bible stuff. And he was telling me about where all these soldiers are. And it was an awesome story. So I'm going to butcher it. But this is basically he was just telling the story of 1 Kings 18 and 19. It's the story of Elijah. Especially Elijah defeats, remember the 450 prophets of Baal? These, these, these prophets, they're like, you know, it's him against 450. And they have this contest. Who can call down fire from heaven? And they're like, you know, well, a ball, whatever, and nothing comes down, right? And he's like, uh, Elijah's mocking him. He's like, oh, maybe he doesn't hear you. Maybe he's, uh, you know, doing this. Uh, Tim Gray knows the scripture. He said, they, he said maybe they're off, he, he's off, the ball's off using the bathroom or something. <laughs> and, and so he's mocking them like, you know, crazy. Nothing happens. Then he's like, now pour water over it. It comes Elijah's turn. He calls down fire from heaven. It consumes everything. And then they kill all the 450 prophets of Baal. Well, then Elijah, and he Tim was telling me, then Elijah gets this note from Jezebel, the evil queen. And she basically says, by this time tomorrow, you will be like they are, dead. And so Elijah says, I'm not afraid of you. I just called down fire from heaven. God's going to be with me. No, he didn't say that. What did he do? He got scared and he ran off. <laughs> And he went into a funk and he got all depressed and sad and he was like under this tree and he went to sleep like we do sometimes when we're depressed. He's like went to sleep and then like the Lord sent him some food, he ate the food and then he went back to sleep, right? And the Lord's like, hey, eat, eat the food. Now go out to, to Mount Horeb. And he walked to Mount Horeb for 40 days and he's there at Mount Horeb. And, uh, and, he's, and the Lord said, what are you doing here? Which is a strange question. But any, what are you doing here? And he's like, Lord, I'm the only one left. Everybody else is like going after the prophets of Baal and every, no, nobody's faithful except for me. And you know, he's just like, Complaining again, I think. That's my interpretation. That was Tim's. And then what does the Lord do? You know, Elijah, Eli, then the Lord, there's this great wind, right? That breaks rocks. That's what a big wind. But it says the Lord wasn't in the, that, that great wind. And then there's this earthquake, and the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And then there's this fire, and the Lord wasn't in the fire. And then there's this still, small voice. And the Lord was in that voice. And Elijah, you know, and then, and then, then he said to Elijah sometime after that, or he's like, um, what are you doing, Elijah? I said, this is a neat question. What are you doing, Elijah? And Elijah says, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and slain your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one who's faithful now. Well, then the Lord tells him, I've still got 7,000 in Israel, basically who haven't bent the knee to Baal and haven't kissed him. You think you're the only one? I've got 7,000. You ever feel that way where you think you're the only one? The Lord has his people, even if we don't see them. That was what Tim was saying to me in this. Even if we don't see them. And Elijah, and then, you know, then he tells Elijah, um, you know, hey, you go off, anoint this king, and then we're going to have Elisha take your place. Um, shucks. You know, maybe he should, he should have seen that the Lord's at work. Sometimes when we look in the world, it seems like the world is so powerful. It has so many people, so many powerful forces. What are we? We have God. He's the one who created the world and everything. He can do what he wants, too. And he, and he can do what he wants with little things. It was a still, small voice. Elijah had done this big thing calling down fire, but the Lord was in the still small voice and he's in the people. And his people have a name, Tim was telling me. Salt. 
They're the salt of the earth. And he said, you know, salt, if you put it on a steak or something like that, the salt goes out and then it disappears. You can't see it on the steak, but you can sure taste it. God's people are invisible a lot of times. They're the little souls that people completely ignore and think mean nothing. Hey, you're not great. You don't have all, you know, who are you? You're not famous like all the, but they're the greatest. They're the ones that uphold the world to their prayers and can help save the world. All right, so the Lord is raising up an army. We might not be able to see it, and it's an army that is called to call down fire from heaven, like Elijah, with that confidence, uh, calling it down in ourselves, which is our offering to merciful love, and then calling that down on the world through the masses that we attend and through the chapel of divine mercy as we beg for mercy. Um, now, one, one last thing is, is that while our army may be hidden and sort of loosely organized, it doesn't have to be, right? It doesn't have to be. And in fact, it's sometimes helpful when soldiers band together and support one another. It's helpful when there's structure and order and discipline. Well, that's what I'd said in the introduction is those, the Marian missionaries of divine mercy. Remember I talked about the Marian missionaries of divine mercy? So if you complete all of the programs, it's meant to be an army of trying to bring together some of these little souls who are trying to help save the world through their consecration to divine mercy, their consecration to Mary, their trust in God's merciful love. So basically that's my parting gift to you guys, right? is this Marian Missionaries of Divine Mercy. It's a challenge to you. Go through all the programs if you haven't. Or if you've gone through all, become a Marian Missionary of Divine Mercy and join some of this army and enjoy the prayer, the mutual prayers for one another and the support that we would give to one another in this battle. Because the world has so many different things. But we need some support. And we have other support and things like that. And if, if it's not this, if it's not the Marian Missionaries, join something. Do something. Because remember, don't forget, one of the most necessary ingredients with the little way, keep trying. That's not a throwaway line. Remember what the Lord said to Elijah? What are you doing? It's a question. We make your consecration to divine mercy. Now what are you doing? Right? I'm giving you something. You know, make a plan of life. Make, uh, put out an effort. F use those opportunities. I'm giving you the Marian missionaries of divine mercy as, as a potential thing. Right? It's got structure, a plan of life. It's got community of well-formed soldiers who are consecrated to Mary, consecrated to divine mercy. But if not that, find something. Do something. Let's make use of the means that we have, the confession, the sacraments, scripture, all of the things that are at our disposal. Taking time to prayer, putting together a plan. That's really trying. In the world, we try all kinds of things. When we got like a big deadline or something, we do all this stuff. When we had this, we had a lot of planning. What are we doing for our spiritual lives? Marian Missionaries of Divine, Divine Mercy is one option to learn more. Again, there's the free handbook, which you've got to pay for the shipping because we can't afford it, but you got the free handbook and you can read about it and see if you want to do that. But if not this, then something. So, again, in the beginning, I hope you're happy. I'm happy. Oh, my gosh, I'm so happy to be done with it. I know. And, and to be able to send this out. But, again, congratulations to you guys. Some of you guys have done the consecrations. Some of you are getting ready to do it. Well, congratulations to those of you who have done it. Congratulations to those of you who haven't. When you do it, congratulations from Father Mike. Um, and uh, congratulations on finishing this program. You know, this isn't easy. Doing, you know, you're doing your reading, and if you didn't do it perfectly, that's okay. Still do your consecration. Uh, and then just do it better the next time. You can renew it. But I hope that, that your consecration to divine mercy, your offering to merciful love, will be a firm decision for you to become a saint. A firm decision for you to become a, a saint so that God can use us as a hidden army that will call down and bring down divine mercy, which can help us in our families, in our communities, in our country, in the whole world. Because mercy, not us, mercy can save the world. As John Paul II, as Pope Francis, as Pope Benedict have said, in so many ways, the only hope for the world is God's mercy. Um, and we can bring that down if we ask the Lord. We have to just ask Him. You know, I have to do all these big things, be little souls asking for mercy. So please pray for me. Uh, I'll pray for you. We'll pray that we become saints, uh, but according to the little way. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks very much.